Good morning, bon dia. Buenos días a todos y muchas gracias por acompañarnos. Al inicio del 2022, el COVID-19 To COVID-19 and its economic and social consequences are still a main concern all around the world. Governments have faced the big challenges of maintaining a balance between preserving lives and the need of saving economies, protecting economies. It's, uh, their resilience has also been tested. They have had to adapt their strategies in order to adapt to new circumstances. In the case of Latin America, it is important to underline the differences between countries. And although they should be individually analyzed in general terms, the pandemic has ravaged the region that was already in a complex context in which social and economic problems have not yet been solved. Although economic recovery has been uh, a thriving, different problems could make this uh, recovery more complex. The public opinion that was uh, published in this forum uh, report has been conducted in 18 countries of the region. Um, garnering uh, information on five different areas, ranging from technology to economy. The main concerns of the respondents to this query are 
centered on uh, unemployment, democracy de de deterioration, polarization, uncertainty in terms of uh, public policy. And uh, concerning the environment, we can mention um, natural disasters and the loss of biodiversity. In terms of of diversity, the lack of biodiversity is also seen as a threat. So when it comes to economy, the main concern is on economic stagnation, debt, inflation, and volatility of prices of raw materials. The different measures in order to incentivate the economy were vital in order to protect people's revenues also in order to guarantee their revenues to preserve jobs and to save companies. However, the burden of public debt has increased. Public budget will still be very, very uh, tight, which underlines the need of a major collaboration between public sector and private sector in order to face those challenges. Of course, there are positive aspects, and many opportunities have emerged. Our region that has a lot of natural resources and uh, very precious human capital should be at the spearhead of those opportunities in terms of energy transition, green jobs, green markets, modern infrastructure, and we should be preparing new generation using the new technology capacities and to align to the new opportunities in terms of jobs. So in a large scale, we need to preserve the potential of Latin America in order to face this great recovery. And we need, in order to do so, to learn the lessons that the past years have left in order to coordinate the new, a new and more productive action it is a privilege and an honor to receive Mr. President Duque from Colombia, President Alvarado from Costa Rica, President Lasso from Ecuador, President Chanvete from Guatemala, and President Castillo from Peru, President Claver Caron from the IGB also joins us, and we're going to be conducting a conversation on an outlook of the new opportunities and perspectives of Latin America and what is needed in order to reach a sustainable development. Economic Forum, Borge Brende, to conduct this dialogue. Borge, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Marisol. Thank you so much for that thoughtful uh, introduction. Marisol uh, is our Latin America director at the World Economic Forum and a great friend and also a great promoter of Latin America uh, at the World Economic uh, Forum. As we all know, uh, economically things look uh, a lot better for Latin America in 2022 than in 2021. The economies are really uh, reviving. We are expecting more than 7% uh, economic growth. Uh, of course, it's important that this growth is inclusive, creates decent jobs and also uh, are complying uh, with sustainability. And we are so privileged to have uh, these five uh, statesmen from Latin America with us, the five presidents, and uh, we're looking so much forward to hearing uh, also from you um, how you look at 2022, what are your aspirations, and in which context are you operating. Let me first go to you, uh, President Duque of Colombia, with that question. What are your aspirations? for 2022, and uh, in what context are you operating? Over Borge, Thank you very much, Borger. And uh, a very special salutation to Mr. President Jan Mete, President Lasso, President Castillo, and uh, President Alvarado. And of course, hello to Marisol Argueta. And I would like to extend my salutations, my salutations to our friend, Mr. President Mauricio Claver Caron. Borgia, I would like to say one thing. Colombia has closed 2021 with very positive result, with an economic growth that is reaching, we hope so, 10%. Yesterday, we had the results by uh, the month of November. 
we have reached a great a greater level of massive vaccination and we have reached a new deal a new colombia deal colombian deal which uh, so what are our goals for 2022 it they can be summarized as follows a massive vaccination we should keep reaching the highest um, figures for the first and second shots and we are having more and more people that are getting uh, the third shot. The second objective for Colombia is to place our growth above 5% and to promote economies of our region. Third, to recover all the sustainable levels in terms of jobs that we had before the pandemic. And something that is very important, we still need to keep closing the social gaps. In this area, we have different priorities. Now we have um, a general um, matriculation for 97 percent of higher education students second we have consolidated a real growth in terms of um, minimum wage we have built a lot of social housing and a lot of works public works that were ever made in colombia so with all this our goal is to keep uh, to keep up with the growth and to keep the same level in 2022 our main objective, however, is to um, to promote growth, but keep promoting equality and keep closing the social gaps in Colombia. Those are our, our priorities. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. Muchas gracias. Let us then move to President uh, Alvarado in Costa Rica. What are your expectations and goals uh, for 2022? 20, uh, Welcome, Mr. President. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Borger. Thank you, Marisol. I would like to extend a very warm uh, salutation to uh, my homologues, different presidents that have joined us in this conversation, and also President Mr. Claver Curran. It's a privilege to be joined by you all. So one of the main things, of, um, the most important things in for Costa Rica is to keep uh, going forward in this process of vaccination, which is the only exit for this uh, health crisis. More than 85% of the Costa Rican po uh, population has been vaccinated with two shots, which is a very important point for our countries, which means that 70% of the local population, including children under five years old, have been fully vaccinated and another uh, very important data that I would like to share with you is that we have already started the process of vaccinating children under uh, from five to seven years in terms of um, in terms of unemployment we still uh, we are still reaching the same levels of, that we have uh, before the pandemic however we need to concentrate on the social gap and different gaps that the pandemic has left us and all the governments in the region need to focus on that education has been affected the pandemic have uh, revealed a lot of inequalities in terms of education and how the education re can reach our um, boys and girls education is the future so we need to intervene there in order to reduce the gap in terms of education so now when it comes to uh, the environment we need to integrate the environment within those components we should not be, uh, see the environment as a separated item the world economic forum has uh, has pointed out that the main risk that the world is facing are linked to the loss of biodiversity and the climate change. So we need to take actions in that area. Different of uh, tax, uh, tax spaces in Latin America have been affected by the pandemic and by the shrinkage of the economy. So we need to work all together within the region in order to give access to development to everybody. A lot of our countries, all of the population of our countries have been castigated by the pandemic from that point of view. And another problem, fundamental problem that we are facing is that this um, group of different problems, so we have migration, we have unemployment, all of that can produce social unrest at different levels. I mean, there is no 
a sole solution, a sole action that can solve all the problems of the countries in Latin America. So I think that we need to act in different fronts in order to reach this transformation that we desire. And another thing that is key for us is reducing unemployment. We have a lot of challenges ahead. However, we are very happy for the progress that we have made so far. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. I know it's my honor to go to Ecuador and you, Mr. Uh, President uh, Lasso. The floor is yours. Muy buenos días. Good morning. Good morning, Borja Brenda. Hello, Marisol Argueta. I would like also to greet my colleagues, presidents of Colombia, Peru, Guatemala, and Costa Rica. And also, I'd like to extend my, sal my salutations to the president of the IGB, Mr. Claver Corona. 2021 was a year, a very difficult year for uh, Ecuador. If we compare that to the economic results of 2020, we can, also, we, can, we can, however, say that this year was better for Ecuador. Nevertheless, uh, the, job rec the, the recovery that we have been promoted in terms of jobs has been very positive. We have recovered 70% of jobs that were lost during 2020, during the pandemic. We, all, we always have said, we have always said that the vaccination is not only a social or health program, but it is the main program that will enable social reactivation, social recovery. Up to date, if we take into account the population under five years old or from five years old on one, they have been vaccinated. 87% of the population have been vaccinated with one shot and with both shots, 82%. And third shot has been administrated to around 15% of the population. And we are preparing ourselves so that starting from February 1st, we're going to start vaccinating children from three to five year old. This vaccination plan, which has been very successful, has enabled us to face this new Omicron wave in a better way, in a more prepared way. Hospitals have not been saturated, especially in the ICUs. So says, our goal will be thus to reinforce this vaccination program. At the same time, we should understand the uh, management that we have made of the pandemic within our societies. We should have open societies so that we can uh, garnish, uh, we can harness the power of this economy, economic recovery. Uh, 2022 has started with a very important action, an environmental action last Friday along with uh, Mr. President Duque and the ministers of foreign affairs from Panama and uh, ex-president Mr. Bill Clinton. We have inaugurated a new reserve in Mandat, which are 70,000 square kilometers of water in the Galapagos area. And this uh, reserve will be part of a new sea corridor connecting with the Coco Island in Costa Rica, Malpelo in Colombia, and with Coiba in Panama. We have also we have also had uh, new actions uh, targeting uh, entrepreneurs, smaller entrepreneurs, with new credits up to 30 years in order to reactivate popular economy and in order to reactivate the uh, sectors that are in need of more uh, support from the state. We are planning to uh, champion a job reform in order to promote a job creation, especially in Ecuador. In the last 20 years, this indicator has not changed. Only three out of 10 Ecuadorians that are part of the active uh, population in terms of the economy that, that have jobs, it only three of them, 30% of them have formal jobs. So that's why we need to reform the uh, job market, the labor market. This will be part of a social and a political uh, reform. That's a main challenge of our government. And 
in, and at the end of me of my intervention, I would like to mention this new uh, trade agreement that we are uh, reaching with Mexico that opens a new area for free trade in the Pacific and that will enable, will open the Ecuadorian economy and that will attract foreign investments. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, President Lasso. Let's uh, now uh, go to the two last presidents. We uh, will uh, then go uh, to Guatemala. Uh, President uh, Giamatti, uh, great to see you. And after you, we'll go to Peru and President uh, Castillo. So, President uh, Giamatti, uh, what are your aspirations and goals uh, for this uh, coming year? And in which context are you operating? Thank you very much, Borger. Good afternoon to everyone, especially our my colleagues, presidents of different countries of Latin America. Hello, Marisol. Hello, Mauricio. Thank you very much for allowing us to join the conversation. In terms of the economy, the uh, pandemic of COVID-19 has left a lot of um, a, a lot of effects, a lot of impact. It has impacted our growth, and we closed 2021 with a growth of 7.5 percent, which is above twice higher than our indicator in the last 25 years. So our challenge this year is to keep up with it, with the economic recovery, and we hope to reach. 6% uh, of economic growth for this year. And we want to make sure that we keep recovering the labor market. Today, we have recovered the, we, we are at the same level of the pre-pandemic levels. And this has been done because the country has been attracting a lot of uh, foreign investment, around $620 million. And uh, in 2021, this figure has been tripled. For this year, we hope that with the new train that has been built, we have already signed the contract. We are trying to change the uh, geography of the country. We want to connect Guatemala to Canada using the same uh, rails. We want to use that for our exports. And we have already signed the uh, new trade agreement with Mexico. So I can say that in terms of Latin America integration, we are moving forward. We have uh, conducted different actions with what with uh, other countries such as Honduras, and this reflects a tighter and more effective interaction that enables us to have a perfect, a better look on the situation. And we have been fighting against trafficking. And actually, the budget for this year has not included more credits coming from abroad. We are facing these, uh, this uh, conductor using our, our own resources. So we hope that this year we're going to reach the goal of 77,000 million, 77 billion dollars that we were aiming last year. So and we're going to go beyond that. We want to reach 82 billion dollars, and we hope. We will. We hope we will have a growing economy, and we hope to turn Guatemala into an investment des and a destination for investment. And last year, only concerning new investments, we have reached or we have created more um, direct and indirect jobs. So perspectives for this year should include that, and they should also include a better access for vaccination. The uh, vaccination program has not been open for children. We're still waiting for that. And the uh, vaccination program for children above uh, 12 years old, it's still ongoing. We're vaccinating more than 100,000 people every day. This has been very difficult, but we have made it. And we have reached the goal of 60% of, of people that have been vaccinated, which means 45% of double vaccinated people. However, we are still moving forward with this program. We, we, we also know that the Omicron variant will um, 
will affect us, will leave a lot of consequences. However, the saturation of hospitals has, is not the same, uh, has not reached the same levels of last year. When I came to the president, uh, when, when I came to uh, to office, uh, the levels of and um, the levels of saturation, hospital saturation, were horrible. But in the perspectives that we have now are better. So the challenge that we have now is not only to promote our growth. It is not only that now. The big challenge is to know how to turn this growth into something sustainable. So that we can use the economic power that we have in order to recover the labor market and to stop illegal migration, creating more, more prosperity, more jobs, more housing, better health, better education, more security. So the challenge nowadays is to make this growth in, into something sustainable and to generate more uh, better conditions to prosperity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's now uh, a great pleasure to go to Lima and Peru and a warm welcome to you, uh, President uh, Castillo. Uh, great to see you and uh, over to you and for your aspirations uh, for the new year. Muy buenos días. Good morning. Good afternoon, Good afternoon colleagues, heads of states and uh, authorities and to all the audience. Hello from Peru. Our main concern and priority since I came to office last July has been to overcome the serious crisis produced by COVID-19. This crisis has reached Peru at a very precarious moment in terms of the health system. We have had a lot of deaths to deplore. At the same time, $1 billion have been affected to vaccine acquisitions. More than 70 million doses have entered the country. So thanks to that, we have vaccinated more than 84% of the general population. This year, we're going to receive around 55 additional doses, 55 million additional doses. So this remarkable effort that we have managed to reach have helped, has helped us to reduce the number of victims. And this has been also accompanied by different tests, cryogenic tests, antigen tests, and also we have hired thousands of technicians and professionals in the realm of health. The second priority is economic recovery, a sustainable and inclusive economic recovery. We have used around $10 billion for public investments in strategic areas such as the education, transport, and health. At the same time, we have unlocked investment projects and we have signed contracts for basic infrastructure, which generates thousands of jobs. Those measures have enabled us and have allowed us and will keep allowing us to improve the economic situation of Peru. Peru has a general GDP of around of around 13%, has growth around 13% in 2021. And this figure actually has been affected by the pandemic. So facing that, we should have, we, we, we have had to carry out economic reforms. And we hope that those economic reforms are going to make their effects. So the economic growth in Peru and in Latin America from July and uh, October of last year, we have created more than 300,000 additional jobs, which is very important. So this is why we're going to keep making, making all the efforts possible in order to make sure that economic growth can be reflected upon jobs, on creating uh, quality jobs that will help the Peruvian population, especially those in need. 
On the other hand, the third priority for us is to promote private investment because it is the engine of social welfare and of economic recovery. In Peru, we want to reach an atmosphere of trust for everyone. So that, that's why we want to invest in energy. We want to massify the use of natural gas, especially in transport, so that we can make sure that all country is connected. So in that area, our government seize this opportunity in order to invite uh, entrepreneurs, national entrepreneurs and foreigners to invest in Peru because we are committed to uh, be responsible with the economy. We want to create a legal fra framework that is beneficial for foreign investments. We are creating new contracts that will benefit our population. We reiterate that this is an open and transparent dialogue within the framework, within a legal framework. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, uh, Mr. President. So great to have you uh, with us. Uh, based on uh, the five very substantial and visionary uh, contributions from uh, the five uh, leaders of uh, Latin America, it is then just natural to go to President uh, Claver Caron of uh, IDB. And uh, uh, good morning to you in DC. And um, based on these very important uh, contributions, how does IDB perceive the region's outlook uh, in the short and uh, midterm? Welcome. Thanks so much. First of all, thanks to you, Borges. Thanks to Marisol. Thanks to World Economic Forum. It's really great to be here. And it's such an honor to participate with these five presidents, President Duque, President Alvarado, President Lasso, President Jamate, President Castillo, who are all dear friends. And they're just not five presidents. They're five leaders. What you've done here, Jorge, is you've highlighted, Marisol, you've highlighted here five success, diverse success stories of handling the pandemic, of fiscal management, of inflationary pressures, and focusing on growth. And we work really closely with all of them here at the IDB, and they're rightly focused on addressing uh, today's macro outlooks and, and really generate the change that's needed. So thank you, all of you, uh, for, for the leadership. Uh, uh, great leaders uh, from the region. Considering, obviously, the last few years, think about the future, which is what we're looking at. Not only has Latin America and the Caribbean avoided, and this is important, avoided a lost decade in macro terms, So, but today what we need to be focused on is that we not have a decade of missed opportunities in regards to narrowing the socioeconomic gaps. And that's not going to be easy. And we know, if you've heard from the presidents that we've heard today, obviously, they're still recovering from the shocks, both economic and social, that were induced by COVID-19. And while we all know this has been primarily a human tragedy in macro terms, we tracked, as you know, a 7% loss of GDP in 2020, the worst single-year contraction in the last two centuries, in 200 years. We also experienced a high mortality rate uh, in 2021 uh, from any country and any region in the world. So as expected, the countries of the region have have been left with higher debts. They need to rebuild those fiscal buffers. And inflation, we all know around the world, it's a global issue, has picked up, so there's less room for expansionary monetary policy. Likewise, there's increase in inequality, and the region has not yet recovered from all the jobs that were lost in the 2020 recession, although we see that there's progress there. However, and this is where I highlight however, because I always like to focus on the positive, despite those unprecedented impacts, 2021 saw stronger growth than projected. And that's so important. You know, in January 2021, everyone was crying. You heard all the numbers, uh, you know, CEPAL, IMF, World Bank, everybody, all do doom and gloom, 2%, 3%. And yet it was almost 7% growth in the region. And higher growth is expected for at least 19 of our 26 borrowing members. And that's good news. And that's due to a lot of that hard work. That growth was due to that hard work, to the historic level of coordination across internal, external consideration, including fiscal monetary efforts that were implemented across the region. This past year, we've also seen a major increase, and this is so important, in venture capital and e-commerce, which are now booming in parts of the region, and tourism is starting to show signs of picking up. By the way, fintechs, 35% of the world's fintechs are in Latin America and the Caribbean. $20 billion in new investment in fintechs have gone into the region this year. So what we have to do now as we enter this third year of fighting COVID and we face this critical juncture, obviously Omicron is gonna increase uncertainty uh, regarding the economic outlook and, uh, and high commodity prices are also likely to recede, or maybe not, we'll see. The Federal Reserve has indicated it's gonna raise interest rates this year, so that's gonna have a cause uh, and has certainly uh, have an impact on, on, on the asset purchase programs that are gonna be phased out, and then you're gonna start seeing some outflows, et cetera. We're all hearing 
that do with these structural issues. Growth rates 2022 are converging to levels closer to 3%, but I'm hoping that's wrong again. And my job is to be a forecast breaker. I hate forecasts and that we break them so that we can hear the growth that we've heard from these great leaders throughout the region and that we can serve the development needs there. The region is uniquely and well-placed. And that's why I'm so optimistic to take advantage of the growing global demand to overcome existing constraints. And we're seeing this in inflation, right? And Latin American can be the solution and not a victim of these inflationary trends. So we're driving progress to meet the opportunities for growth, competitiveness, digitalization, gender equality, climate-friendly growth, the strengthening of value chains. That's how, how the Latin America and the Caribbean can be a, an inflation breaker, can, can lead to a solution instead of being a victim. So I think we have a generational opportunity to benefit from supply chain discussions, which we're seeing, and IDB is successfully promoting more than ever in the history of the region. We, are, we did almost $3 billion just on nearshoring uh, investments in, in that regard. So investments, logistics, infrastructure, it's a powerhouse, this region for everything related to the export of food, agricultural products, and it's well positioned to promote those services and manufactured products with those high added values. I also think there's a huge opportunity for growth and competitiveness that, that can arise from digitalization, SMEs, gender equality. We've seen all of that in climate. This region is beginning to take those critically important steps to unleash the power of the private sector in new ways. You've heard it from all of these leaders here today with speed, innovation, and growth. And taking into account the pandemic, this region has turned the corner in recent weeks. Despite earlier this year representing the majority of those COVID fatalities, we ended 2021 with nearly 60% of people already having two doses. So now Latin America and the Caribbean, which began the year as being a way in the back of the line in regards to vaccination, is now the leader of the world in vaccinations. And we're proud here at the IDB to have supported this effort with financing new tools and launching the region's recovery. So in the short long-term recovery, driving our Vision 2025 strategy, we're determined to work with all of these countries, with all these leaders, so the next decade is one of opportunities. And finally, I'm super excited to say that in doing so, in 2021, the IDB set a new record of over $23 billion. We did over $23 billion in financing and mobilization for, those, for, our, for these countries, for our borrowing members, and that was made possible by people all across the region working with these new tools with a renewed effort to share our goals. So we're optimistic of what 2022 is going to bring because we're going to break even those $23 billion record. Thank you so much. And thank you for injecting also some further energy and uh, also optimism uh, to the discussion. Uh, I would uh, like to go uh, back and uh, start maybe in uh, Central America with you, uh, President uh, Guillermo uh, of Guatemala. Uh, we know that uh, migration is a big issue of uh, great concern worldwide. Uh, hence, the World Economic Forum has joined the Partnership for Central America, this coalition, to address the root causes of migration. I wonder, how is your government responding in terms of creating the enabling conditions locally for Guatemalans not to choose to migrate? You already touched on it in your opening speech, but maybe you could uh, be even a bit more granular. Over to you. Thank you very much for that question, Berger. So we need to analyze migration from a structural point of view, not from a conjunctural point of view. Most of the time, we only tackle the immediate phenomenon but we neglect the roots of migrations. We do believe we should tackle both things. In terms of the circumstances, the circumstantial causes, we have passed a bill in, the, in, in, in our Congress in order to cover those people working in an in, working for working as smugglers from our region to Latin America. And for, because this is one of the roots of, of migration. With this, we are telling the world that we have to generate uh, prosperity walls. Because real, real walls do not stop migration. Those things that will stop uh, migration is prosperity. More reasons for human beings to stay in their homeland. So this is why that's the message we are telling the world. Because we're object, we, we are we are the countries sending migrants all abroad. So we need to tackle that uh, root cause. If people have jobs, if people have security, if people have health and quality education, people will not migrate. People migrate because they need to. For example, when when we talk about climate change. 
change, it is clear that climate change is affecting our region and the Caribbean. And year after year, we need to rebuild everything in the country after the hurricane season. Although only 33% of greenhouse gases are emitted by our region, we are suffering. Uh, the causes uh, or, or the consequences of climate change. And so that's why we need to generate new opportunities. And instead of, you know, concern, concentrating on creating new opportunities, we are concentrating on rebuilding the countries. So what we need to do is to create a more uh, a world with more solidarity, with more investments. And we need to protect such investments within a legal framework. That's what we're working for. We're creating this new bill for investments so that foreign investments can come into the country with the same conditions with and, and, and a fair play. We, are, we will not change those conditions uh, during the year so that they can feel safe to come and invest in Guatemala. And we are also reforming the uh, strategic infrastructure in the country. We have reformed uh, this uh, infrastructure uh, we and we, we've been doing that uh, in the last 10 years. So now new investors are coming to Guatemala in order to take advantage of the uh, uh, new structure created for investments, and we are promoting experts in order to create more uh, workforce and more um, job opportunities. We are creating new opportunities for not only big corporations, we are also focusing on uh, small and medium companies. and. Because this is a main factor that will lead us to tackle poverty. This is why we're telling the whole world that we need to create a social responsibility for the consumers so that people can know which product can choose. Because you can you can choose between two products if you choose one a product coming from a big corporation, you will not be helping the small producers. So people need to know that when you purchase a product, you are helping your fellow countrymen. And this is something that the consumers should know because this will promote the national and local economy. This is one of the solutions that we have elaborated. One of the, the first solution, the first list of solutions has been already validated and certified. We are opening new opportunities for experts for products for, uh, coming from or produced by poor uh, producers. And uh, in terms of migration, I can also say that we won't tackle migration if, won't, if, we, if we do not concentrate on the reasons why people are migrating. We need to improve the conditions in their own country because people do not migrate because they want to. They get a more complicated life if they choose to migrate. So this is why we we're going to keep working in order to make sure that that economic growth profit, uh, benefits even the smallest uh, citizen, because even the smallest citizen should take advantage of this growth. There is no other way to get out of poverty if it is not work. So this is why our government should concentrate on generating new jobs and reforming the countries, reforming social programs in order to establish a link with our population and to cover the human needs. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. Thank you for that leadership. Uh, it is uh, a great uh, challenge. Uh, let me uh, go back to you, President Lasso of Ecuador. Uh, you have been strongly emphasizing this vision related to promotion of democracy and political cohesion and uh, dialogue in Ecuador. And this is, of course, an issue of great relevance across the region so uh, what is your um, message uh, in this uh, regard in a more pan-Latin American, uh, pan-American uh, context? In Ecuador, in Ecuador, in Ecuador we have established what we have called um, New, a new way of government, a new government that is based on ethics and basic agreements reached within the government and with different sectors without any regard to political position, gender, etc. We need an economic and inclusive growth within the framework of the rule of law and with a fixed and, and, and with a tax program full of solidarity that promotes new opportunities that will benefit 
the whole population. The progress of our peoples do not only depend on economic growth, but it also depends on the uh, quality of life of our population. So they, they also depend on social cohesion, on the respect of human rights, on tolerance, and on taking into account the opinion of minorities. And that has been the goal of my government. So this is why today in Ecuador we can proudly say that we have recovered essential principles such as freedom of speech, um, press freedom, and the balance between powers. And we have ended every form of political persecution. This is our vision, a vision that maybe answers your question. And so this is our, pos our position nowadays. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that vision. Uh, let me then uh, go to Peru and you, President uh, Castillo. Uh, great to have you with us. And as you know, the World Economic Forum has promoted the importance of stakeholder capitalism, and, and that um, uh, entails that the world uh, should also increasingly acknowledge uh, the importance of building a system to serve the interest of all stakeholders, not only um, those that are owning the stock uh, in a company, uh, but also to society at large. So I wonder, Mr. President, what is your vision on the role of government and business in creating value for society at large? I know you care a lot about this. Thank you very much. The pandemic has shown us that the market by itself cannot face global challenges in terms of health, in terms of education, in the environment or social matters. Peru agrees with the WEF when we say that, mar that the market needs a commitment from different states, states committed to reforms aiming at uh, sustainable and inclusive development. At the same time, the states require the help of private companies to promote uh, productive diversity. We need companies to, in, to invest in, on, in the employees, supporting them, supporting communities, and protecting the environment. Within, a, within such a context, such as nowadays, uh, public and private cooperation is needed more than ever in order to reach our social and environmental goals and in order to rebuild trust among political, um, among the different political actors. So within the, this uh, context of social and economic recovery and rebuilding trust, the Peruvian state has, a store, has an historic debt with the population in terms of education and health. Nowadays, we're carrying out different reforms aiming at reinforcing the first level of attention in the health system, and we want to um, find a new and better educational system. Nowadays, our government is focused on guaranteeing a safe return for boys and girls to educational institutions so that they can go back school to school safely. Schools should be a safe place in terms of health, in terms of food, in terms of the cooperation with the family. At a midterm, we are accelerating social investment. We are trying to push forward our works in order to reach our educational um, goals. We need to uh, invest 6% of the GDP in health and education. We want to use this budget to improve our conditions. Another debt that, has, that the Peruvian state has is the resolution of social conflicts and social upheaval. We have inherited, we, my government has inherited of that. And those are historic uh, problems. So it is important to say that our government um, agrees and uh, is with the population. And we are listening to the demands. 
that were unheard for decades. So our position is clear. We need to, we want to promote a social dialogue because it is important. This social dialogue is crucial uh, when it comes to finding a definite uh, solution to social conflicts in, in, in different areas or the oil, the oil uh, industry, the mining industry, the environmental um, area is also important. But in order to do that, we need uh, the investment of the, of the private sector in order to guarantee the uh, social um, stability of our country. In this sense, the Peruvian government has been implementing a multi-sectorial strategy, including the participation of different actors of our country. That's how our government has started 2022. We are moving forward towards a satisfactory solution. We want to encompass all those operations. We have invited the private uh, companies and uh, the public sector to work on finding a solution for social conflicts because Closing these social gaps is a matter for all of us. It's an important matter for all of us. We need to act with a lot of responsibility. We need to respect different cultures, traditions, peoples, and local communities. Thank you so much, and thank you for underlining the importance of dialogue and also uh, the social uh, dialogue. Let's go back. Uh, let's go back to Central America and to Costa Rica and President uh, Alvarado. We know that Costa Rica for decades have uh, been at the forefront of the environmental agenda, the biodiversity agenda, and has shown commitment and leadership in this field. And what are Costa Rica's most important accomplishments related to uh, the green economy in your viewpoint, uh, Mr. President? And can that uh, lesson uh, and that policy, policy also be applicable and an opportunity for the rest of Latin America? Thank you very much, Berger. One of the most important things for us was the decarbonization plan of 2019 for us. So back in the day, we adopted that plan within the framework of the Paris agreements. Let me give you a couple of examples of how this can benefit the environment, but has also positive economic impacts. We have approved a hydrogen policy in Costa Rica, and within the next two months, we are going to establish a new rate for green hydrogen um, production by using renewable energies. And with the production accidents, we're going to use that in order to export green hydrogen. We're going to use that also to create jobs, attract investments, and create clean and green energy. So this is an example of how environmental policies have also have not only economic economic impacts, but also um, environmental impacts. Another thing was the exploration of the El Coco Island. And this is a very big example of how Latin America can come together. I would like to congratulate my friend, President Lasso, who enlarged the protected area of the Galapagos Island. And we have reached a very uh, important agreement with uh, Colombia and Panama in that area. So those four countries that have come together have created a very good example for a climate for actions against climate change. One of the most remarkable things that were mentioned during the last uh, COP26 in Glasgow was this example. And this will benefit not only the environment, but it will also benefit the future of our economies and the health of our economies because the environment is not only the cherry on top of the cake, it's not an accessory. The environment is an important matter. And in the, in the, in the near future, this matter will become more and more important and will be a condition for foreign investments and for consumers. They will ask countries to, uh, a certain level of compliance in terms of um, environmental uh, issues. And this will, and if we fail to do so, many jobs will be at risk, present and future jobs. So I think that we should keep doing that. 
within the region. Latin America should not act as a region that is adopted, that is a region that is adopting uh, environmental policies very late. We need to be at the, at the spearhead of this. We need to give the example of what we can do uh, when it comes to climate change. But we can, we should also ask the most polluting countries to uh, respect their commitments, to observe the, their commitments. So in Costa Rica, the environmental policy is to be at the spearhead and to give the example. The example that things can be done, and this is something that we have managed to do in within the region, and I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of my country, but I've, but I'm also very proud of my neighbor countries and my friends, my colleague, the presidents of the region. Thank you so much. Uh, let me uh, continue on this uh, nature and climate agenda and go to you, uh, President uh, Duque of Colombia. Uh, you have also shown a lot of leadership here, and your government has mobilized ambitious efforts and initiatives around the carbon neutrality and not at least the energy transition agenda. So what are the key opportunities and challenges in this regard uh, for Colombia and the region uh, moving ahead? Jorge, muchísimo. Thank you very much, Jorge. And once again, I would like to, to congratulate my colleagues for their interventions. I would like to underline that Colombia has a very ambitious and clear agenda, and that is aimed at results. It is result-oriented. We have just approved almost unanimously within the Congress, we have approved the Climate Action Bill that I would like to call the Climate constitution of Colombia that makes sure that we will reach the net zero by 2050. But in order to reach that goal, we need to go through several steps. By 2030, we should reduce the emission of greenhouse gases by 51 percent. Within this bill, within this law, we have um, elaborated a list of different areas when we want to take action. And at the same time, I would like to talk about the energy matrix. At the beginning of my administration, we only had 28 megawatts of um, non, of non conventional renewable energy, only 0.2% of our energy um, uh, assets. We are going to end this year with more than 2,000 megawatts of, in terms of capacity of renewable energies in Colombia. So, which means we're going to multiply, we're going to multiply the capacity of renewable energies that we used to have at the beginning of my in my administration. All of this in order to accelerate the energy transition. Third thing, uh, clean mobility. We have passed a law that incentivates the use of electric cars. Nowadays, we have the biggest electric cars fleet of Latin America. And uh, the same goes of electric vehicles for freight. And uh, we have more than 7,000 particular vehicles that have been purchased by, by our government. Two years ago, we launched an initiative of the Watch Trillion Trillion Three Trees. We committed with a certain goal, more than three million trees planted this year, and we're going to reach this goal. And I'm very proud that we opened the road for green hydrogen in Colombia. We did that in two months ago, and we're going to have the first electrolyzer that is going to be installed in our country in the next weeks. And uh, our, in our industry is using oil in order to generate this new kinds of energy. I would like to underline also that we are using the contracts for natural uh, preservation and we are working with communities, farmers and local communities in order to launch a new dynamic carbon dynamic which is which is going to go along what we have been working on in this in this forum the biodiversity cities protecting ecosystems and protecting nature colombia is the second country in terms of 
biodiversity in Latin America. We have 50% of plains in the world, 35% corresponds to the Amazonian forest. And Borgia, I would like to say something else. Colombia only represents 0.6% of greenhouse emissions, but it is among the most, uh, the, uh, the countries at most risk by the consequences of climate change. We will not wait until 2030. 30% of the Colombian territory will be de declared as protected areas and which places at the spearhead of this um, of this issue. So we are actually we are actually complying with our commitments. And I would like to close my intervention by saying that today we need to make sure that all this green agenda is funded. We need to make sure that this climate action will not end up being something without any infrastructure or any progress. We need to establish priorities, and this means more access to um, uh, funding tools, more investments, long-term investments from the public and the private center in order to consolidate our fight for the net zero. And this should be a priority for the different regions in the region. So we need to work, in order to do that, we need to work with the IDB because it is the structure that should fund this initiative that, that will lead us to 2050. So this is why we we have joined this initiative. We need to focus on this agenda, which is very good. However, it should be funded by the IDB. The IDB has always worked alongside with us, but the IDB should have more resources so that they can comply with the increased demand of funding. And Borger, I would like to say to you that today the climate action is not an accessory. It's not a cost. Today, our region's competitiveness needs to be competitive from a green point of view. All the countries in the hemisphere do not pollute the environment, but other countries within the same forum are working towards that goal, which means that one dollar invested in our countries is a more responsible dollar in terms of harmony with the environment when it and for us this is a priority without a doubt well thank you so much um, president uh, Duque thank you for your leadership uh, on uh, the Amazon basin and also for uh, the one trillion uh, trees initiative uh, from Davos. I think uh, your comments is a great uh, segue also into President uh, Claver uh, Caron, IDB. You heard um, President uh, Duque here appealing for more investment and uh, investments. And we know that investment is key for the region's economic recovery and also for the future. So what are, in your view, uh, the strategic areas for investments to drive Latin America's recovery and productivity? in the future. Over to you in DC. Thank you. I appreciate it, Jorge. And, and by the way, strategic is the key word there. Let me just say two quick things. In regards to President Duque, and I thank you for the, for the plug and the support of all the presidents here in regards to that. But it's all the more important that the IDB has the resources necessary because, again, as inflation rises throughout the world globally, as interest rates go up, we're going to start seeing pressures. We're going to start seeing a lot of countries priced out of the markets. And the partnership with multilateral institutions, the partnership with the IDB, those countries that have created uh, their portfolios with the IDB are going to help the region get through this area, whether it's transitory or long-term inflation. We don't know. I'm not in, you know, we're not, we're gonna, it's not an academic debate, but we need to get through 2022. And that partnership with the IDB is going to be all the more important as we see these inflationary and interest rate pressures, all the more important in that regards. And President Castillo said something very important about public-private partnerships. Now is the time for private-public partnerships. We're talking today about growth. We're talking today about opportunities. We're talking about recovery thanks to the greatest public-private partnership in modern history, which was the creation of a vaccine for COVID-19 within a year. So it's all the more important that we continue to focus on this. But you mentioned about these strategic pillars. Look, we have five strategic investment pillars that have this power. Strengthening of value chains and the nearshoring, which we've talked a lot about. Digitalization, small, medium-sized enterprises, that growth, that's where the formal jobs will come from and we help move them in that regard. Gender equality, which has a completely transformational opportunity for GDP uh, in the region and climate action, as we've heard from President Alvarado and others and President Lasso and his leadership uh, in that regards. I mean, these are huge opportunities in that regards, and we're working harder than ever to really realize that growth opportunity in all of these areas. 
But the strategic value has to also depend on efficiency. And historically, investment has not only been low in the region, but it's led to lower levels of growth in Latin America and the Caribbean compared to other regions of the world. And, 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 and given the importance of the region in the global scale, both of those are unacceptable when we're working. Among the root causes that we've seen in that regards is a lack of really of a well-developed capital markets that's led to lack of instruments and high economic volatility we're working in that regards to help move past that. But we also need to improve investment environments and frameworks. And you're talking here to five leaders that have worked and have been really an example for the region on good investment environments and frameworks uh, that are modern, transparent, business friendly, that allow for those possible investment opportunities. Restoring levels of trust. We just did a report on, on trust uh, here. That's going to be key. Addressing persistent corruption also going to be fundamental in this effort. So we're actively working with the countries to improve the quality of those investment frameworks for both public and private sector investment. And that's going to apply their modernization as well as those sectors that they govern. Let me give you an example. Our economic simulations show that within two years of making the increased investment needed to digitalize service positive net benefits begin to appear. And by the year 10, that can have like a growth of 6% of GDP. And that's going to mean that countries have to put those forward, those investments today, and be ready for the brief adjustment period during which economies can absorb those investments. But the medium to long-term benefits are undoubtedly clear. And one result to highlight is that in addition to producing that economic growth, digitalization of services is going to allow for improved inclusion as well. The real income of the two poorest quintiles would increase an average 16% more than the income of the two richest quintiles. And that's key. Also, increased level of transparency that digitalization is just key can bring is also going to improve investor and public confidence that's going to generate higher levels of growth. Let me reiterate, this is something that I've really been saying since the beginning of this crisis. The recovery will be largely driven by the private sector, and there's too much ground to be recovered and too much private sector potential that's waiting to be tapped. And all these leaders have been looking to tap that, and we've been working with them. What we've observed and what we've heard today is that all of our countries, large, small, wherever they may be on the political spectrum, know that investment is good for growth and prosperity. And that's also key. We talk about like political uncertainty. Look, whether you're from the left, the center or the right, everybody, every president in this region agrees that investment is key and foreign direct investment is key. And I'm proud to say that in addition to the work that I previously mentioned, we've done a lot this year in the IDB to attract private investment to the region more than any time in our 61 year history. Along with the strategic approach, we had the network of investment promotion events we did had in Ecuador, Guatemala, and others. We generated over $50 billion in deals for the region in 2021. We're also rapidly expanding the largest private sector coalition in the history bank that we created last year, went from 40 of the biggest companies in the world to over 150. We're starting to look like the World Economic Forum here. And we've had a record level, record level of mobilization by a private sector arm, IDB Invest. When I ran for president of IDB, I said, Mobilizing 50 cents for every dollar we invest from IDB Invest is unacceptable. This year, we've done dollar for dollar, a record in the history of this bank. So there's widespread interest in the region on the private sector side. We're working together, and I think this is going to have huge, huge potential, huge opportunities, and we're going to take advantage of them. No, thank you so much. Uh, you know, we are, uh, had a great interaction, and uh, the time has been running so fast. So... Um, I, I would love to uh, go back to uh, just each of the presidents uh, for one minute uh, closing remarks, uh, aspirations for the new year, but also um, regional challenges uh, needs regional solutions. So I wonder if we could uh, be able then to stick to one minute each, because I think we all want to close on time at 5.15. So let me go first to uh, present uh, Giamatti uh, in uh, Guatemala, uh, Mr. President. One minute is very short to tell everything, but uh, you know we have to have a much a world in which there is much more uh, solidarity. We have to have more interaction in the country. Our, uh, you know, our principal, our main uh, commercial uh, partner is the region. You know, Guatemala has a program which has. Uh, which stems from the private initiative with a public initiative. And like that, we'll be able to overcome this uh, 15 or 100 years of a lacking back, you know. But we have to, you know, uh, get together, join hands, and uh, really push and promote 
uh, the trade and vaccines and anything we need to overcome the pandemics at the regional uh, level. You know, there is a spirit here in Latin America to try to find all the conditions at the local level, but we have to look for alliances with uh, greater countries such as our as uh, Mexico and uh, the United States and remove barriers uh, thanks uh, to walls and uh, walls of prosperity. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I, that was really well done uh, in one minute. Uh, let me then go to uh, Peru and you, uh, President uh, Castillo, over to you. Una America. A united Latin America is of the utmost importance to think uh, solutions and find them uh, to have a uh, development model, which up to now has not been enough, even before the pandemic. Many years ago, the uh, economic uh, progress in our region was um, stagnant, completely stagnant, and inequalities have worsened with the pandemic. So it's of the utmost importance that the uh, Peruvian uh, people are united and all the Latin American people are united and all of us here are united, and not only from an economic uh, standpoint. Of course, economic growth is necessary, but it is also absolutely necessary to implement, to design and implement uh, social policies, especially in education and health and employment generation. Uh, to try to comply with the um, um, said, um, economic goals, uh, sustainable economic goals. Uh, so we need to be solidary with, uh, um, among ourselves, for instance, in um, food safety, in food security, uh, universal access to health and education, uh, leisure, um, foreign investment, a fight against terrorism, organized crime and corruption. Uh, we think that protection, protecting the human rights and protecting uh, everybody's uh, rights, uh, gender equality, the uh, respect to um, indigenous peoples. Well, our government is convinced that uh, Latin American integration is uh, far uh, more uh, important uh, than all the uh, aspects that separate us, that divide us. So it's important that the life and the health of our citizens, the economy of all the populations, the defense of democracy and institutions, for instance, what was said uh, with, with this um, encounter today, well, this is a way to show that there is a genuine interest for uh, Latin America that uh, follows a common agenda. All the people here present, we are brothers in uh, a political will to have a solidarity and cooperation in Latin America all together. Thank you. Alvarado, uh, Costa Rica, and then President Duque. Thank you very much, Borge. First of all, I think that during the pandemic, it was shown that there is a huge inequality in the world, of course, within the countries too, but also inequalities among countries. And I think that many of the countries uh, really uh, responded, the, the richest ones, uh, with a strategy of auto-protection, self-protection, which was aligned uh, with uh, some kind of um, selfishness. And as Mauricio has just said, the president of IDB, today Latin America shows that it's one of the regions where vaccination is the most advanced. And that's to say that we have a population that is willing uh, to get vaccinated, but we didn't have the vaccines to do so. And this would have radically changed all the economical situation. The most intelligent uh, strategy at a regional and a global level is solidarity. And in Latin America, the solidarity has to do with what President Jamate was saying and President Castillo was saying, a common agenda. This common agenda that um, transcends ideologies, but it's to the benefit of our peoples, is one of the great tasks that are still pending in our region. The building of a common agenda that overcomes uh, the differences in ideology, but that covers all the interests of all our citizens. The example of the ocean uh, of our four countries uh, shows what we are capable of doing when we are together. 
and this is something that we have also would have to do also in the spaces of a regional fora uh, to uh, build a huge uh, force of transformation in Latin America. Thanks to the uh, World Economic uh, Forum and Marisol for giving us this opportunity to speak. Joining us, uh, President Duque, uh, Colombia, one minute. Muchas gracias, Borges, y de nuevo, mi... Thank you very much, Borge, and uh, thanks to all my colleagues here. I would just like to close this meeting saying that we need to reinforce multilateralism, um, reinforce in the um, in, and, and community of nations, uh, of whom President Lasso is now president. Um, we are going to give the presidency of all of, of other uh, forum to uh, Mexico now, ProSur, to with the presidency of uh, Uruguay. But now we need to also reinforce, for instance, the um, organiza organization of uh, American states and CARICOM to uh, with the Caribbean region. And we need to reinforce the uh, financial institutions in our hemisphere, reinforce IDB, capitalize it, uh, reinforce CA, Fond Plata, to reinforce all the uh, financing network, but starting with the uh, Inter-American uh, Development Bank. This is absolutely crucial to go on working with CAF and the other organisms because the uh, financing organisms need to grow to accompany Latin America. And something else which is really important is to reinforce democracy in our southern hemisphere. We have a democracy democratic chart in Latin America, and we need to understand that development needs to be built in democracy, and democracy uh, means to defend the uh, economic uh, freedoms. Any threat to these um, free um, initiative uh, of way of uh, working uh, has to be questioned, and we need, of course, to defend equity and uh, fight against inequalities. Um, and I want to say that in Colombia, we are we are we have increased the uh, minimum revenue as we had never done before in 50 years. The, it's the greatest investment that we have uh, that any government has uh, had all respecting um, freedoms, social freedoms. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, President Lasso, uh, Ecuador. Thank you. The world has um, challenges that are not common and that cannot be dealt uh, with separately. What can just one country do to fight against climate change, for instance? We need the commitment of everybody here. We need the integration of everybody uh, for common goals, that each country uh, be more and more present in the world and that the world be more and more present in each country. I agree with the views of my colleagues here about the need of insisting and in encouraging and strengthening all the um, regional integration mechanisms. And I particularly agree with my uh, dear uh, friend, the president of Colombia, Ivan Duque. As for Ecuador, these last 15 years, we have lost, we have been losing a bit uh, the time. And now we need to recover it, integrating Ecuador in the world and the world in Ecuador. And this is based upon a very, very simple concept. In the world, we have 7.4 billion inhabitants. And in Ecuador, we are only 17 uh, million seven hundred thousand Equatorians. So we need to sell more to the world. We need to sell more to the world, and this means more jobs in Ecuador. And we need uh, to receive here more foreign investment in Ecuador because this means more jobs and more opportunities for Equatorians. That's why we have set ourselves some goals. For instance, in the next three years, we want to subscribe 10 um, trade agreements. We are uh, pursuing a trade agreement with Mexico, for instance, because this will enable us to access to the Pacific Alliance. And we have also trade agreements with the United States, Japan, uh, South Korea, China, Israel, Canada, Panama, the, uh, Repub the Dominican Republic, Costa Rica. That's to say, this is the hugest, uh, um, the, the, 
um, trade agreements, um, all these trade agreements will benefit the Equatorian population. It's diplomacy through uh, and for the prosperity of the Equatorian uh, population. I thank the uh, World Economic Forum for this opportunity that they have given us to participate in this important event and to give here our views about all the subjects that you have uh, um, posted. So thank you very much, Borg Brandy. Uh, thanks also to Mauricio claver Caron. Thanks uh, to Marisol, too. And thanks to all my colleagues here from uh, Colombia, Peru, Costa Rica, uh, and uh, Guatemala, and Colombia again. So thank you and uh, greetings to all of you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, let me, uh, at the end, give you, uh, President Claver uh, Caron, IDB, uh, 30 seconds uh, to do closing remarks, because we're already three minutes. It's our time, but I know you're an effective speaker. Don't worry, I'm going to speak really fast. But first of all, muchas gracias, Presidente Duque, a todos por... Thank you, President Duke, and thanks to everybody. I th uh, thank you for your support. Uh, IDB is the best proposal for all Latin America. And Three seconds on trust, and it's an issue that we talk about, but little's done. We just did a great new report on trust. I recommend everybody reads it. Around the world, trust is inhibiting. The lack of trust is inhibiting inclusive, sustainable growth. It's undermining long-term development goals. We see confidence levels in Latin America and the Caribbean are a quarter of those in OECD countries. Any country that wants to attract investment, ensure sound and socioeconomic development must accept the simple fact. Establishing trust is essential from everything. Job creation, public health, public safety, rule of law, democracy. We need that. It's essential. I trust all five leaders here. They have done a good job. You're hearing from them what they're doing. Any investor out there needs to look at these countries. These are opportunities. Let me tell you, at the beginning of 20, I'm going to shut up with this, Lord, no word. At the beginning of 2021, we had, you know, everyone was doom and gloom. I was right here, doom and gloom. It was going to be Latin America, lost decade, lowest growth in the region, no vaccination, et cetera. Here we are, January 2022. 2021 had surpassed any other region in the world in growth. All the forecasts were wrong, and it's a leader in vaccines. Let's give the region the credit it merits, the trust it merits, and let's look at these opportunities. And IDB is a great partner for that. So thank you so much. And thank you, WEF, also a great partner in that regard. Appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you so much. I would like, uh, on behalf of uh, Marisol uh, and the Latin America team uh, that has done a great job to bring you all together here, uh, to thank you so much. I found this uh, conversation and uh, discussion very fruitful. Thank you for your leadership and thank you for being part of this uh, community. Uh, the World Economic Forum wants to be a partner with you. Uh, on the digital transformation, uh, the nature and climate transformation that we are faced with, but also when it comes to ensuring that growth in the future, and we are again seeing growth in Latin America, is going to be more inclusive and also create a lot of decent jobs for a lot of young people in Latin America. So thank you so much for joining us. Muchas gracias. It's been a great session. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Adios. Thank you.